Voices of America presents the Fred Allen Show. The Fred Allen Show with Fred's guest, the new literary lion, Mr. James A. Farley, Falkland Hoffa, Minerva Pius, Peter Donald, Parker Fenley, the DeMarco sisters, and Al Goodman in his orchestra. And this is Kenny Delmar speaking for your friendly Ford dealer. He's the man who knows your Ford from F to D and from bumper to bumper. What's more, he's vitally interested in your Ford. He wants to see that it gives you the best possible service. His mechanics are Ford-trained experts working with special Ford equipment. They use methods approved by the Ford factory and genuine Ford parts. So you can expect a better job done in less time and at a lower cost when you take your Ford back home for service. Ladies and gentlemen, this week a survey reported that the life expectancy of the average man is 62 and 6 tenths years. Tonight, we present an average man who hopes to live to be as old as his joke. He's Fred Allen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In Portland, what is this life expectancy business? What is that? The average man is supposed to live 62 years. Oh, that's silly. That's what Mama says. What? A man can't get his Social Security until he's 65. Well, if he only lives to be 62... The man will have to be dead three years before he can apply for his Social Security. <laughs> well, the, the Marshall Plan is better than that. How does that work? Well, to get money under the Marshall Plan, you have to be living, but not in this country. <laughs> Enough about life expectancy. What is our laugh expectancy for this evening? Oh, I have some clippings. Oh, clippings. Good. What's in the news? Last Sunday, Edgar Bergen's program wasn't on the air. No kidding. You mean that Edgar's listeners didn't have a chance to hear that singing jingle? A royal pudding. Rich, 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 flavor. Boots, 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 They didn't have a chance. Music lovers, no. jingle lovers didn't hear that. And eh? Jack Benny's program was off at the beginning, and he was cut off at the end, too. The beginning and the end were off, eh? Uh huh. Now, if they can only find a way to do something about the middle of Benny's program, <laughs> radio will really be making progress, Portland. I read that Jack's going to England this summer. Yes, he's America's answer to C. Aubrey Smith. <laughs> Oh, you're always picking on Jack. Why not? Benny is the only actor in Hollywood who has a burglar alarm on his garbage pail. <laughs> Jack lost Ronald Coleman's Oscar. I know that. Mrs. Levant called Benny up to see if he could do as much for her. <laughs> I mean, that's not libelous, is it? Is that libel? You're liable to get a letter from Oscar for that. <laughs> Tell me, what uh, What else is new? They caught a man from New Jersey selling horse meat in New York. No kidding. How did they catch him? Somebody found a racing form in a beef stew. No <laughs> I had a steak one time. I think it came from a steeplechase horse. Why? Every time I stuck my fork in the steak, it jumped over the mashed potato. <laughs> And after that, I think I'll jump over the next two jokes, Portland, and start for Alan's out. What is your question tonight? Well, last week, the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Mastodonic and Super Colossal Circus opened here at Madison Square Garden. And so our question naturally is, what did you like best about this year's edition of the circus? Shall we go? As the stocking said when the garter broke, there's nothing to hold me up. <laughs> Here we are, back in Allen's Alley, Portland. Say, I guess Senator Claghorn's in all right. His Ford is parked in the mule stall. The mule must be in the house putting on the feed bag with the senator. Well, let's not. Somebody, I say somebody put the skin to my mansion. Oh, it's you, Jowl Eyes. 
jowl eyes. Now, wait a minute, Senator. Oh, your head looks lumpy, son. I can see you got something on your mind. Well, yes, Senator. Well, fill it, son. I'm busier than a sinner's kneecap at a revival meeting. Uh, <laughs> you know, the baseball season opens in Washington tomorrow. I'm getting little old Harry in shape. Well, is, <laughs> is, the, is the president going to participate in the game? Oh, well, sure is. This year, Harry will play ball with anybody. <laughs> Yeah, you know, he can't wait to throw that first ball out to the Washington team. Well, why? It'll be the first time this year the Senators have taken anything from Harry. <laughs> well, tell me, Senator, how do you think the baseball season is going to uh, turn out? Well, the Taft-Hartley Act is going to make it hard on umpires. The Taft-Hartley Act? Well, uh, before an umpire can call a strike, he'll have to get out an injunction. <laughs> Well, look, tell me, Senator, what about the circus this year? Have you seen... Well, it? son, the circus ain't got nothing we ain't got down in Washington. You, uh... Pick them clowns. We got more clowns in Washington than the circus ever seen. <laughs> and, uh, them you bang you. We got politicians with bigger mouths than any you bang you. <laughs> but... Take that juggler keeping 20 Indian clubs in the air. Congress has got the whole country up in the air. Well, what about the strong man, Senator? He carried 20 men on his back. Well, carrying 20 men ain't nothing, son. No? We got a man down in Washington named Staffin. A strong man? He just carried two states, Wisconsin and Nebraska. So long, oh, son. So long, Eddie. Well, I uh, wonder if Harold will put those down later. Well, let's see. Let's see if Mr. Moody is still around. Howdy, Bob. <laughs> well, uh, Mr. Moody, what is your reaction to the circus this year? Oh, shucks. <laughs> circus, circus don't mean nothing to me. Uh, no? No. My whole family was circus folks. Oh, really? Uh, they were freaks, mostly. <laughs> My Uncle Geek Moody. Geek Moody? Geek L. Moody. Yes. He was known as Jojo, the dog-faced boy. He, he was famous. Oh, yes, I've heard of Jojo. Uh, he used to pose for dog food ads. Pose? He posed, eh? Jojo was a man of distemper. Oh. <laughs> and then, my aunt, Mona Moody. Yes. She traveled as Madame Lafarge. Oh, <laughs> Madame Lafarge, eh? She was a bearded lady. Oh. Well, how did your aunt become a bearded lady? Well, she was raised on goat's milk. Yeah. As a baby, she had a little goatee. <laughs> I see. I could see how that would develop. Yeah. By the time she went to the circus, Mona was sure hairy. She was hairy, eh? Her face looked like the elbow of a raccoon court. <laughs> Well, what, are, what other relatives did you have with the circus? Well, my brother, Bunch Moody, he was a duck impersonator. A duck impersonator, eh? But things got bad and he disappeared. He took his feathers and his web feet and disappeared completely? Yeah, there was only one trace. The duck impersonator? He left a big bill at the hotel. <laughs> but tell me, have you, have you yourself ever been with the circus, Titus? Oh. Once when I was a boy, but I got fired. Fired? What happened? Why, my job was feeding Jumbo the elephant. Yeah. After two months, Jumbo lost 400 pounds. He wanted nothing but skin and tusks. Well, how come? I I was nearsighted. Nearsighted? For two months, I was leaving the elephant's hay at the wrong end. <laughs> Elephant's hay at the wrong end. Yeah. Jumbo was starving to death. Uh huh. But he was sitting pretty. So long, uh -huh. <laughs> Titus is too much for me. Let's uh, let's uh, try this next door. Hi there, Jeffy. Oh, Mrs. Nussbaum. How do you feel about the circus this year? I'm going with Mr. and Mrs. Epstein. Oh, the Epsteins, eh? He is in the fur business, a big squeeze. Oh, in the fur <laughs> business. Well, tell me, what uh, what happened at the circus? First, we are seeing the Siamese twins, two girls. Girls, Siamese twins? Standing in front is a big crowd, and everybody's guessing. Guessing what? Which Siamese twin is having the Tony permanent? Oh, <laughs> 
Well, after... <laughs> after viewing the twins... We are seeing the animals until is happening the accident. Oh, say, what, what caused the accident? Well, Mrs. Epstein is wearing, by not her husband is in the fur business, a leopard coat. Oh, I... <laughs> I see. Passing the leopard's cage, Mrs. Epstein is looking first on her coat, Next on the leopard. Uh-huh. And she is saying, for this, I am marrying. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Epstein is saying, what now? What now? Pointing to the leopard, Mrs. Epstein is saying, an animal is wearing a better fur coat than Lulu Bell Epstein. Now. So Mr. Epstein is saying, your coat's with connections I'm buying wholesale. Yeah. Who does a leopard know he could buy wholesale a skin? I see. <laughs> With this, Mrs. Epstein is pouting. She's pouting, eh? Mr. Epstein is saying, The leopard is a phony. His skin is imitation. I will prove it. Being in the business. Through the cage, Mr. Epstein is reaching in the hand to feeling by the leopard the skin. Yes? Why, there is a shriek. A shriek? What happened? You are eating with the circus of the great Eunice. Oh, the fellow who balances himself on only one finger? One finger. You mean the great Eunice? He is formerly Mr. Epstein. <laughs> and that, uh, that brings us to Mr. Cassidy, Shanty. Well, let's stop for a minute or so with Ajax. Well, hey, Jax. Hey, hey, Jax, have you been to the circus yet? Ah, don't mention circus to me. The opening matinee, I took my little nephew, Cosmos O'Shaughnessy. Cosmos O'Shaughnessy? Oh, sure, he's a human wildcat. Really? Well, to keep Cosmos from disrupting the circus, I bought him a box of Cracker Jacks. And I held him firmly by his sticky hand. You walked around holding little Cosmos by the hand. Well, only once I let go. When was that? Well, I was passing a big cage, you see. Yeah. And outside it said Gargantua. Gargantua. Well, I looked in the cage. And this gentleman was in there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I said to myself, says I, Gargantua. He looks like an uncle of mine, Mullet Muldoon. <laughs> Mullet Muldoon, man. Eh? Says I, hello, Mullet. But he just sat there cracking peanuts between his toes. Well, it must have been Gargantua. Unless Mullet was playing possum. Let's possum. <laughs> well, after this episode... So I, I reached out and I took little Cosmos again by the hand. I see. And I looked down. Glory be! What? Be the hand instead of holding little Cosmos O'Shaughnessy with his box of cracker jacks. Yes? I'm holding a midget, a little wrinkled one. A wrinkled? Well, what did you do? Well, the circus was over. What could I do? You took the midget home? I explained the circumstances to Mr. and Mrs. O'Shaughnessy. Yes? He took a shine to the midget. Uh-huh. And the midget took a shine to the O'Shaughnessy. Oh, there was blessings all around. Well, what, what happened to little Cosmos? Uh, if you happen to visit the circus... Yes? And you see a midget with a sticky hand eating cracker jack. Yes? You're looking at Cosmos O'Shaughnessy. Well, tell me, Ajax, how did you personally like the circus? Ah, uh, me boy, they call it the biggest show on earth. To me, it is the di biggest disappointment on earth. Disappointment? The circus? All that sawdust on the floor and you can't buy a drink in the place. Good night. <laughs> now, from the circus, we turn to our musical side show. The five DeMarco sisters and maestro Al Goodman and his big top band combined to give us Tooley Ooly Dooley. Girl? <laughs> When a Swiss boy goes all in on a Christmas in June, doody 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 do, he sings a pretty tune. And he charms her like magic when he don't know this tune. Doody 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 do, needs the Alpine moon, the echo. Where to do, where to do, how to do, do you, do you. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen... Say, Fred. Yes, Kenny? Do you have a minute to help me? I'm writing a love poem. A love... Love... Kenny, why waste time writing a love poem? Call the girl up, reverse the charges, and tell her how you feel about it. <laughs> yeah, but... Why, my... Uh, I know that my poem isn't about a girl. Not about... What no. sort of a dactyl is it? Well, I'll mm-hmm. read it. Listen. Roses are red, violets are blue, Ford's love Ford service, and so will you. What's wrong with that? It starts off swell. Yeah, I know. It's just the next couplet is where I need help. Oh, well. I can't seem to rhyme genuine Ford parts, special equipment, Ford train mechanics, and factory approved methods. Now, oh, let me. That takes a bit of doing, but I may be able to handle it <laughs> pending the arrival of Superman. Let yes. me see. Special equipment. You need a rhyme special. Say, I have it, Kenny. How is this? Special equipment and Ford train mechanics. Stop service worries. Eliminate panics. Oh, that's great, Fred. Great. Yeah. And I have a sock finish. Get this. Your Ford is never nervous when you bring it home for service. How was that, Fred? Well, you want the truth, Kenny. Yeah. It was all right, but you will never be the Edgar Guest of tomorrow. Well, <laughs> maybe not, Fred, but at least my poem tells why the best service from start to finish is designed to cost less at your friendly Ford dealer. Yes, it does. It does do that. <laughs> You have just heard a minute or two from Now is the Hour. Played by Maestro Al Goodman and 25 men who, if their instruments were taken away, would look like the police lineup. And now, say, uh, say, Portland. Yes? Would you help me arrange uh, these chairs around the table here, please? Uh, we're having a literary discussion tonight. Have you found the book? Oh, I have a book, uh, an author, and a brace of critics. Oh, who is the author? Mr. James A. Farley. Who is Mr. James A. Farley? Who is Mr. James A. Farley? He is only one of the most famous figures in American political life. Why, Mr. Farley's new book is sweeping the country. It's number two on the best uh, seller list as of today. Has it been banned in Boston yet? <laughs> No, only in Maine and Vermont. That's right. <laughs> I'm uh, looking forward to this tonight, Portland. This is going to be some dis- uh, discussion. What a night for the literati. Yes, and for the people who, who uh, can read, too. <laughs> there we go. Well, Portland, I guess we're all set. Let's start our book program. Presenting The Author Meets His Match. <laughs> And here, ladies and gentlemen, is your moderator, that popular literary figure, the man who knew Random House when it was just a Quonset hut, <laughs> Mr. Frederick Allen. Thank you, and good evening, fellow bookworms. Tonight, as usual, our program is unrehearsed, unprepared, and uncalled for. <laughs> the book up for discussion this evening is Jim Farley's Story, written by the Honorable James A. Farley. We have a brilliant panel of literary giants assembled this evening. I'm going to ask the critics to introduce themselves. Now, first... I am Dr. Wolfgang Holstein. (laughs) You are a psychiatrist, Dr. Holstein? Yeah, so my office is in Central Park. In Central Park? Yeah, instead of a couch, my patients lay down on a bench. Well, how can patients find you in Central Park? Uh, Simple. You come in from Sixth Avenue, and on the left, you are looking behind a bush and whistling. (laughs) You are behind the bush? I am dressed like a doctor. I am wearing a white coat and white pants. Oh, I see. In between patients, I sell good humor. Doctor, do you, uh, do you by any chance, have a literary background? Oh, so I, I am writing a book now on psychiatry. Oh, a book? It is called From Neurosis to Halitosis. <laughs> very good. Very good. Yeah, the, the bookmark is a package of Sensen. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Holmes. You're welcome. 
Now, our next critic... I am Prudence Saddleford. And you, uh, Miss Paddleford? I am the literary consultant and hostess in charge of tea bags for the Rexall Drugstore. <laughs> you, uh, you review the books before they go on sale at your chain of drugstores? Yes, I select books that will help the sale of our merchandise. Well, just how do you mean that, Miss Paddleford? Well, for example, when we're having a sale of soap, we display Captain from Castile. <laughs> When we have a special on umbrellas, we feature Rain Tree County. Very good. Yes. And when we displayed Bob Hope's book, yes. we were introducing Airwick. Well, now. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Miss Paddle. But now the international celebrity. I am Sergei Stroganov from the Soviet Union, literary correspondent for the world's outstanding daily newspaper, Pravda. You, uh... I am the sworn enemy of yellow journalism, bourgeois music, and things in general. <laughs> Mr. Stroganoff, you are a critic. All my life I have been a critic. That is why I'm in America today. Well, why? I criticize something in Russia. <laughs> Mr. Stroganoff, how do you feel about American books? Americans? Bah! They are all capitalists. The only books the Americans are reading are bank books. <laughs> that will hold you, plutocrat. Thank you, Mr. Stroganoff. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our distinguished author of the evening. I am James A. Farley. <laughs> Mr. Farley, you are the author of Jim Farley's story. I am. Tell me, how did you come to write about yourself? In politics, Mr. Allen, that's the safest thing to do. The, uh, <laughs> the safest? You better write about yourself before somebody else does. Well, will you tell us something about your book, Mr. Farley? I'd be glad to. Jim Farley's story is a sort of a record of my life in politics. Over 35 years of service in the Democratic Party. Well, at what point in your life, uh, Mr. Farley, did you first suspect that you would join this party? When I was a baby, my parents knew I would grow up to be a Democrat. Well, how? A Republican politician who was running for office came around kissing babies. Yes, when he bent over my crib to kiss me... Yes? I bit him on the nose. <laughs> and? Biting that Republican was my first service to the Democratic Party. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Farley. There, ladies and gentlemen, you have our brilliant lineup for tonight. Our author, Mr. James A. Farley, versus our three astounding critics. And now, critic... Oh, excuse me, please. Uh, yes, Dr. Holstein? Uh, Mr. Farley is a very interesting psychological case. Well, how, how do you mean that, Doctor? Well, as a baby, he bit a man on the nose. Yes? This is a sign of frustration. <laughs> the, the baby could not bite his own nose, so he bit somebody else's nose. <laughs> Oh, you Americans always you're sticking your noses into somebody else's business. In Russia, everybody has his nose to the grindstone. It looks terrible. <laughs> oh, uh, speaking of noses, give your nose a treat. Let it smell the perfume on sale at Rexall. Ah, you see, I told you. Now Rexall is putting their business in everybody's noses. Critics, we are here to discuss Mr. Farley's book. Mr. Farley, I've heard you on several radio programs recently speaking about your book in uh, glowing terms. Yes, Mr. Allen, I've appeared with the Fitzgeralds, Mary Margaret McBride, Dorothy and Dick, and author meets the critic. Radio in America, bah! In Russia, the real radio, what program? The masses go the shopping. <laughs> Life can be brutal. And Comrade Linklater's program, people are Bolsheviks. That's radio. <laughs> Excuse me, please. Uh, yes, 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 uh, please, Dr. Holstein, please. yes, Dr. Holstein. I had a patient once who was on the radio. He was a sound man. A sound man? Yeah. All he did was open and close doors. Yes. After five years, he thought he was a door. You say this man thought he was a door? Yeah. He took the buttons off his vest and had a knob sewed on. <laughs> All, all day he went around knocking himself. Well, doctor, did you did you cure this patient? Oh, absolutely, yeah. He he no longer thinks he's a door. No, today he thinks he's a window. <laughs> he goes with his vest pulled up. He thinks he's open. Oh, uh, yes, it is very. Speaking of radio, Rexall carries a complete stock of radios. And remember, if there's no Rexall drugstore in your neighborhood. 
Your neighborhood is no neighborhood. It's a wilderness. Yeah, in America, that's a wilderness. Siberia is a wilderness. Your brain is a wilderness. Who needs you here? Wait, 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 Dr. Holstein, please, if you will. I'm sorry. Control yourself, Doctor. I, uh, I must remind you, critics, we're here to discuss Mr. Farley's book. Now, Mr. Farley, would you tell us, please, some of the uh, highlights of Jim Farley's story? Well, I think one of the most exciting days of my life was the day I was appointed Postmaster General. Postmaster General! That is capitalism. A general can't make enough money being a general. He's got to be a postmaster on the side. Now, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Farley, excuse me. Yes, Dr. Holstein. Uh, you said you were the Postmaster General? Yes, I was appointed in 1933. Yeah, so in 1933, I mailed out a bill to one of my patients. <laughs> The patient never paid me. He says he never got the bill. But what does that concern me, doctor? Well, did you ever have a letter left over in your mail bag? I didn't deliver deliver the mail, doctor. I was the postmaster general. Oh, excuse me. (laughs) Dr. Holstein, did you put a stamp on that letter in 1933? Oh, a stamp? I knew I forgot something. (laughs) A stamp. Stamps remind me. Mm. You make a stamp with your tongue. This week, Rexall is featuring a delicious tongue sandwich. As we say at Rexall, our tongue sandwich speaks for itself. Yeah, this is America. Only a sandwich can speak. A man can't open his mouth. Oh, open your mouth. You don't say nothing, Dr. Holden. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. One more outburst, and I'll adjourn this discussion. I'm sorry, Mr. Farley. Getting back to your book. Today in the New York Times, I noticed that Jim Farley's story is second on the bestseller list. How do you account for that? Well, Mr. Allen, this is an election year. Probably everybody is interested in politics. Yeah, Mr. Farley, as a psychiatrist, I would say that politics, politics is the most... Politics is bourgeois propaganda. Uh, strong enough, I was talking... Talking, talking, always you're talking. Yes, yes, yes. The only honest politics, we are having the secret ballot. The secret ballot? The Communist Party and the other party. What is the other party? That is the secret. <laughs> Quiet, Look at a big mark like you keep a secret. Now, in your book, any... quiet, please. please. In your you book, don't... Mr. Farley, yeah. Mr. Farley, in your book, do you deal with any other subject or do you confine yourself to politics? Well, I mentioned of my business association with the Coca-Cola Company. Yeah, you know, that is most interesting, Mr. Farley. I once had a patient who thought he was a Coca-Cola bottle. A Coca-Cola bottle? Yeah, every time he returned himself to my office, I had to give him a nickel back on himself. <laughs> what finally happened to this patient who thought he was a bottle of Coca-Cola? He blew his top. <laughs> Stop drinking vodka and Coca-Cola. In each glass, we are putting two bear's feet. Two bear's feet? Those are the paws that refresh us. That may be a joke, but Rexall's service is no joke. You are a joke. I'm laughing on you. Yeah, hyenas is always laughing. Touche, Doctor. Hyena, he said. They're calling me a hyena. Quiet, are you listening, Joe? <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Farley. Mr. Farley, we don't seem to be getting anywhere with your book. I don't want to be an old spoil sport, Mr. Allen, but something tells me that none of your critics has read my book. Well, I'll soon find out, critics. Have you read Mr. Farley's book? No. No. This is indeed embarrassing, Mr. Farley. No one on the uh, panel, apparently, has read Jim Farley's story. If we could get a few copies of the book in a hurry... I can take care of that. Well, this is Sunday, Mr. Farley. The bookstores are all closed. Fortunately, I always carry a suitcase full of books with me. Wait until I open this case. But, Mr. Farley... Step right up, folks. Get your copy of Jim Farley's story. Mr. Farley... $3.50, complete with jacket and bookmark. Mr. Farley... You say Jim Farley's story ain't enough? Tell you what I'm going to do. Now, wait a minute. Get away, boys. You bother me. Here you are, folks. With every copy of Jim Farley's story, I'm giving a all point back. I want to thank Mr. James A. Farley for joining us tonight and Mr. Jack Eigen for tuning us in. And I want to remind you that your Ford dealer is now showing the new Ford trucks. And from all reports, these trucks are really something. The new line of 139 models includes the biggest Ford trucks ever built. And they're all bonus built, which means built extra strong to last longer. See them at your Ford dealers. Next week, our guest will be Brooklyn's man of the hour, Leo DeRosa. Thank you and good night. Good night. Thank you.
program came to you from New York. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.